Well, I'm very uh, delighted to be able to talk to Kumi Naidu, who is a, uh, uh, he's the Payne lecturer at the Freeman Spokely Institute here at Stanford uh, this year. Uh, but Kumi has a very distinguished career, uh, really as an activist in several different capacities. Uh, you were a, as I understand it, a teenage uh, leader of the anti-apartheid movement in your native South Africa. Uh, you went on to play a big role in environmental activism as the uh, head of Greenpeace and then also in human rights of uh, being um, uh, uh, director of, uh, um, uh, sorry, Amnesty Amnesty International, we'll, yeah. we'll get that right. Um, and um, you're now uh, here at Stanford uh, taking some time to, you know, reflect on all these experiences. But let's just begin with the current world situation and what you regard as the, you know, the, the multiple crises that, that we're facing. Uh, and we should, you know, I think necessarily begin with the environment because that's the one that's kind of the background to everything that happens in the world at the moment. So firstly, thank you for having me, Frank. Um, What's different about the environmental crisis and the climate crisis specifically is that unlike any other crisis that we face, like take an issue such as trying to achieve full gender equality. Now it's pathetic that after so much of effort, we'd still have such a low level of gender equality when we look at it globally. But there isn't a clock that is ticking at the center of the table saying mm -hmm. you've got to sort gender yeah. equality by a certain time. Whereas with the climate crisis, the science is very clear where the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which arguably is probably the largest scientific enterprise in the in history of humanity, they said in 2018 mm -hmm. that we had 12 years to get emissions to pick, peak and start coming down rapidly. And sadly, we are really not on a trajectory to achieve that. I think it's also important to note that, you know, even though right now people talk about the poly crisis or the call it other names, it's not as if it's entirely new, mm -hmm. right? If you think about uh, Obama's one-time chief of staff, uh, Ram Emanuel, he used to say uh, more than a decade ago, a good crisis is a very, yeah. uh, a bad crisis is a very good you know what, a good crisis. It's, it's a missed opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should not use, lose lose a good crisis here. And and so, you know, people have called it different things. People mm -hmm. have called it the convergence of crises. Uh, I called it in a book that I wrote in 2010, uh, Boiling Point, Can Citizen Action Save the World? Mm -hmm. And so on. So, and, and, and if we go back and look at 1997 during the Asian financial crisis, for example, what you see, even at that moment when President Clinton was in power, was there was always a recognition that we needed big change. And I'll tell you the formulation that Clinton and Jim Wolfenton as the president of the World Bank formulated there. They said, the world needs a new international financial architecture. Mm -hmm. right? It's nothing different from what I and other activists are saying. We're saying that the current economic fundamentals are just not working. And then of course, 2008, 2009, also that financial crisis brought it home and yeah. then COVID just completely exposed the fact that a large portion of the citizens on this planet have absolutely no security mm -hmm. and are so vulnerable and so on. But the difficulty is, um, you know, we live in a world that pushes us down the road of specialization. Right? Even in academia, even in activism. Yes, especially in academia. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but even in activism. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have the siloed mentality. You have, mm -hmm. you know, Amnesty working on human rights, Greenpeace working on environment and, and, and so on. And I think to get out of this convergence of crises, because the crises are intersecting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's not as if they are in silos, right? Mm -hmm. Requires a significantly more intersectional approach. And in fact, I go so far as saying we need to turbocharge intersectionality mm -hmm. in our thinking and our practice and, and our efforts. And we are far away from that, but I hope that by embracing that, 
we get a better chance at unpacking right. how the different crises come together and how we can get out of them. Well, we're speaking in the year 2024 when we have two active big wars, wars going, going on. on. And that, you know, uh, those have been driven in certain respects by some of the, you know, uh, not directly by climate change, but, you know, they're, they're very much related. And certainly the wars themselves have had huge impacts on our ability to deal with climate. You know, so, for example, Russia, Absolutely. you know, uh, you have to replace all that gas and oil that you're sanctioning Russia for. And uh, so the Biden administration has now turned America into the biggest uh, oil and gas exporter. And, yep. Yeah. So I, I, I think... Um, the conflicts that we are seeing. And by the way, you know, there's also, I would say, like a little bit of an unevenness mm -hmm. of how we look at, at conflicts. So mm -hmm. the Ukraine-Russia um, yeah. conflict and the Israel-Palestinian conflict uh, has got, at the moment, prime time, if mm -hmm. you want, in mm -hmm. terms of media. But, but I just wanted to flag that there are actually quite a lot of other serious conflicts that are taking place right oh, now Sudan, in Sudan, Sudan for Sudan example, yeah. Haiti, mm -hmm. uh, at a different scale, you yeah. know, uh, and so on. So that points to, again, another sort of sense of the crisis that these things are happening also because of a failure of governance, right? Mm -hmm. And and also, I would argue that we didn't listen to what President Dwight Eisenhower told us in 1961 as he stepped out of office when he said, beware the military-industrial complex. Mm -hmm. If we let it go unchecked, it could actually become a source of real threat to democracy. And and, and so, because you, you see, I think the question that sometimes ordinary people ask, certainly in my context at home, whenever things like this happen, they say, we must ask who benefits from it. Who benefits from the conflict mm -hmm. financially, mm -hmm. right? And, and people often are manipulated into being in the side or that side. But let's understand that the very nature of the military industrial complex today is that it has to be fed. It is a very powerful and large industry. And even if conflicts didn't exist, right, somebody would manufacture them somewhere because somebody needs to produce weapons of sophistication and scale that otherwise some very powerful people go out of business. I realize mm -hmm. this might be mm -hmm. cynical for some mm -hmm. people to hear, but, but you know, in a world that presumably after all the conflict we've had, people accept that why is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Why does war flourish yeah. in the way that it does? Yeah. So let's talk about how you then push back in this kind of a situation. Uh, you are, are someone that spent your time in grassroots mobilization. Uh, and, you know, how do you reflect on that? I mean, what are the limits of that? Uh, obviously, uh, you need top-down action because it's governments that make these bad decisions, but the governments are hopefully somehow responsive or accountable to what goes on at the grassroots. Uh, how do you approach, you know, the general issue of mobilization and activism? So, if I'm brutally honest and reflect on a lot of my activism over the last three decades, say, a lot of it was actually appealing to power, mm -hmm. you know, organizing people to the best as we could mm -hmm. and using that organized presence to appeal to those in either corporate power or primarily governmental power to make the changes often they say they want to make. Mm -hmm. To be honest, it's not as if the demands that most civil society movements make are not largely what governments pay lip service to, mm -hmm. right? They do. So now when I reflect on the choices that I made, I'm very self-critical about one mistake that I made, which is this mistaking of access mm -hmm. for influence. Mm -hmm. So when the Berlin Wall came down, you know, People were talking about a global associational revolution. They were talking about a power shift. They were talking about a peace dividend. You know, it was quite an optimistic time in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and what we though saw in reality 
is that we had many countries introducing elections for the first time or after a long hiatus. And I think to a large extent, we made the mistake of confusing elections for democracy. Right. Right. That's the one thing. And then secondly, the activist response was, wow, we've been invited by our political leaders for this consultation and this green paper con conversation and this white paper conversation. In fact, I jokingly used to say in the period in South Africa from the first democratic elections from 94 to 99, the Mandela term, that activists were suffering from a unique medical condition that you could call consultation fatigue, yeah, uh -huh. you know, because, because you've been consulted to death right. and, and you got caught up. I got caught up into, wow, we never had this access mm -hmm. and this is great. We can influence mm -hmm. decision making. But when I reflect on it more soberly, I come up with a feeling that the, the persons on the government side were ticking off a box saying civil society consulted, mm -hmm. made them feel good. We ticked off a box sort of government lobbied against mm -hmm. and not much changed yeah. because the power dynamic oftentimes was such that if governments were able to get certain activists in the room just for a conversation, just to say we heard you out, then they felt they contained it. Yeah. So where does that leave activism in the current moment? So I think firstly, like any situation, you don't want to have a toolbox that is limited to just one or two tools. Mm -hmm. You need to have a diversity of different things in that toolbox. I am not saying, for example, that what I described about these engagements with the government, which some people call handshake activism. Yeah. I'm not saying that we should never do it. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is, let's get the proportionality mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Because if you go into those meetings, my experience teaches me, and if the person that you're meeting with doesn't feel that you have a serious constituency behind you. They can be very polite and very nice and mm -hmm. very agreeable, but they know they are under no obligation mm -hmm. to follow through on it because you got no power. Right. And so what I've been criticized for and on reflection, I think there is legitimacy in that criticism, which is I didn't quite get the proportionality between my gaze, how much of my gaze and my focus was on on, on government mm -hmm. and power and how much of the gaze and the focus was on the powerless to enable the powerless to get better organized mm -hmm. so that they will be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And let's be clear, most governments can be more dismissive of middle class, uh, educated people who have degrees and might live in better neighborhoods and so on. It's harder to dismiss a large number of poor working class people who are angry, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and governments take that more seriously and the failure to harness that means that in the power dynamic, it's very different. The other thing is, the other weakness of activism is, and, and I feel quite responsible in some of the roles I've played of falling into this trap because you feel, okay, you know, there's a human rights approach to development. And we all say, oh, we have to train everybody in this human rights approach and we workshop them to death. And what happens in the whole quest for professionalization mm -hmm. and for being able to speak the policy language of our time, we then start sounding like politicians, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thinking like politicians. And we, what we are saying bears no resonance with the people in whose names we're acting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so, and, and then associated with that is where are our narratives aimed, right? Oftentimes we're trying to move people with rationality, with facts, like say on climate, mm -hmm. right? You know, 1.5 degrees, 350 parts per million and a thousand right. acronyms and so on that are, mm -hmm. people are drowning in an alphabet soup mm -hmm. in, in the climate mm -hmm. space. And what we do is we neglect the heart, mind, body and soul. Mm -hmm. You know, we focus everything on the brain, mm -hmm. you know, policies and so on. And that's not how people are, are moved. And I'm sad to say that if you look at, say, Steve Bannon and Donald Trump, mm -hmm. 
they've done two very powerful things. One is they've abandoned facts completely. And I'm not, I'm not for a moment suggesting we should do that. No. But the reason to do that, because they know that that does not move people. What moves people is whether you can arouse the emotions. Mm -hmm. And you can arouse people's emotions more easily when you're getting them to hate some other group or to weaponize some identity question and and also when you are outrageous mm -hmm. and also quite funny yeah i mean you know in the first election quite a lot of people said you know we voted for donald trump because he was really funny right it right. was quite funny having him in the process right? a lot of entertainment value. a lot of entertainment yeah. value yeah. yeah so so this has to be a time for activism to ask new questions and imagine different ways of being. I'm not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater. A lot of what's there is good, right? Mm -hmm. But like one of the things is we don't you we have not harnessed the power of arts and culture which can reach people and move people in ways that speeches and thick documents and policy proposals cannot do. Mm -hmm. And especially in a context where people are educationally deprived like mm -hmm. in South Africa mm -hmm. where we have so many people who don't are not fully literate and so on how do you interact with them other than through a language that they understand so I would go so far as saying harnessing the full power of arts and culture will not deliver us a solution from climate crisis mm -hmm. or the intersecting crises however failure to harness the full power of arts and culture means we almost don't have a chance of reversing mm -hmm the big faulty trajectory that humanity currently right, is on. Right. So we're here at the Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law. Uh, we study democratic institutions and yet those same democratic institutions have failed to seriously address, you know, these very difficult issues of climate, of war, uh, uh, of poverty. Um, do you think that that's an adequate framework for, uh, you know, people, populations to actually govern themselves, or do we need different kinds of institutional structures uh, that go beyond, you know, what our current democracies are are doing? Well, you know, Winston Churchill used to like to say something along the lines that, you know, democracy is a terrible system, but it's the best one that we have. Mm -hmm. And I think that what is needed at the current moment is to look at those elements from the system which are just absolutely clear that they are good for society. Giving people voice, mm -hmm. for example, right? Mm -hmm. Participation, all of that. But then when you dig in deeper to say, well, what is the quality of participation that we need, right? I mean, I used to describe the United States as a one and a half person, uh, one and a half party democracy, right? Because I think things have changed now where there is more clear distinctions because the Republican Party has gone in such an extreme direction. But in far too many countries around the world, mm -hmm. when people mm -hmm. go to vote in the elections, yeah. they're not going to vote for the best candidate. Mm -hmm. They're going to vote for the least worst candidate. Mm -hmm. And my sense is, Many Americans, for example, feel that way at the mm -hmm. moment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so my own sense is we have to go back to some basics, mm -hmm. right? If we say that elections should be free and fair, right? Because if we don't have that, then people lose faith in the system and then people are not voting and then they, you know, just kind of pull back into the private space. So... How do you have free and fair elections in a country like the United States mm -hmm. where things are so polarized and the very system of elections administration is being challenged, yeah. is being challenged and it's based on a party political affiliation thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That you either have a Secretary of State who's a Republican or a Democrat, right? In many other countries around the world, they would never consider having this because they didn't make the assumption that the levels of trust would ever be as durable over time, right? Yeah. So like in South Africa and many other countries around the world, it's not perfect, right? But we have an independent electoral commission 
whose members are drawn from the cream of the crop of society, if you want. Religious leaders, retired business leaders who had clean records, um, high profile cultural figures, academics, and so on. Mm -hmm. That's not rocket science to mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the context of the US, it will require you know, some uh, procedural change. But right now, I would say for the United States, I cannot see how you recover faith in the election system if you don't do something quite different and where you take it out of right. the two main political parties. And there are many talented people here, right? Uh, in society who can play that role. Mm -hmm. Then I think there's also an issue about accessibility of elections processes to people who are not seen as part of the professional political class. And I have to say that I have seen over the last decade in, in the US and in many other countries around the world as the mainstream political parties ran into difficulties, you're seeing a whole lot of people emerging who were not in the political class of you know, professional politicians. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some good elements to it because it's bringing diversity and so on, but it also has sadly shown that it can attract the most extreme forms of opinion yeah. and which threatens the whole democratic project. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would say quite simply this, right? Democracy is really about celebrating the idea that the participation of people in public life, more than the singular act of voting once every four or five years, but participation in public life in between election periods and so on, is the right thing to do, it's a safe thing to do, it's the durable thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's what gives democracy durability. So if I give you a, a very personal case study now in South Africa, right, where our political leadership has failed us very badly because of mass scale corruption and self-interest, in the community where my wife and I live, for example, we were like, after our local residents association had multiple meetings with local councillors to appeal for the garbage to be picked up, for the roads to be fixed, for the electricity to flow, for the water to be stable and so on. And not, not getting any movement mm -hmm. on it. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the resources have been stolen mm -hmm. and the people that have been deployed into senior civil service roles are party appointees who don't have the competency then we came to the conclusion, well, what's a constructive thing for us to do as citizens? Mm -hmm. Because we can continue to do that. It's never going to give a result. And then we said, okay, maybe one of the things that we need to do in this moment, in our country and globally, is build a different kind of power without trying to undermine the core values of democracy. And what we've done is we said, can we shame them into action from below? Mm -hmm. So for the last 18 months, we started organizing and mobilizing and identifying all the things that we need to fix in our community. Mm -hmm. And then, say for example, garbage removal. So what we said publicly was, we're going to fix the garbage problem. We have capability and agency amongst ourselves. And we invite the utility that is supposed to do that job to come and join us if they are so moved. Mm -hmm. But we're not waiting for you. Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I'll tell you, we had this big cleanup day in our community about three months ago. And we were surprised. Pick It Up, which is the agency in question which has failed us badly, they, they called and said, what can we bring? <laughs> Trucks and brooms and bags and, yeah. and staff, by the way. And they were shamed into... Right? Uh, they, but they were well, shamed into action, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So... The other thing I also think it's very important for activism from a mobilization point of view to always take into account. Don't think in absolutes, which is sometimes a lot of what we do. You know, we say government is corrupt, right, as an absolute. So what I have always believed about local government, and in the end of the day, you know, for many ordinary people, Local government is the most important form right. of government. Absolutely. Right? Because that's where you get your water, your housing, and so on. And I, and I, I always hold the view, 
and and this example of what this cleanup campaign showed it that things would be so much more disastrously bad for us mm -hmm. if there were not some good people fighting the good fight from within those entities mm -hmm. of state mm -hmm. right and that part of our job as activists sometimes is to throw them a lifeline yeah find the good people in institutions and do it strategically do it behind the scenes if you need to but don't abandon them right because by abandoning them you're abandoning the last possible hope you have of some capability within the state to actually support you now obviously this doesn't work on everything this yeah. is very much on service delivery and on basic needs in terms of trying to get macro policy shifts on um you know things like climate change and so on obviously is much more difficult mm -hmm. but the frustration for me is like on most things we've won the argument on climate there's nobody really yeah. saying you know what climate change is you know okay donald trump and maybe a few people e e even the majority of republicans right acknowledge that climate change requires urgent action right so the question for activism is you cannot sit back on your laurels and say, oh, we've won the argument. Because that was only the first part of it. The real hard work is to figure out, well, okay, having won the argument, how do you make that into practicable solutions yeah, yeah. that can actually, in a very real way, impact people's lives? Because there's some point at which people lose hope. Mm -hmm. You know, if people see, well, I've participated in this campaign, I took part in this, I voted for that, and nothing changes, yeah. then that's a real disaster. If people believe that their agency is lost, it's the worst thing for democracy. Yeah, I did a series of lectures last year at Indiana um, uh, about what I called climate realism. Uh, you know, my argument was that, yes, the argument has actually been won, and the COP process was reasonably important in raising people's consciousness about the existence of the problem and its seriousness. But it had kind of run its course because the next thing is to act on that realization and actually implement different policies. And that's where you run into these huge obstacles, you know, on a national level yeah. because you have real economic interests. You know, people exactly. say, okay, I, I, I don't want the more than 1.5 degrees temperature rise, but I also don't want to have to pay twice, you know, for my um, heating bill or... I don't want to have to give up eating beef or, you know, yeah. whatever. And winning, I mean, the implementation actually depends on being able to convince people that they've got to, you know, make short-term sacrifices in order to get to these long-term goals. And that's something that an international agreement doesn't really help you all that much with. It's Absolutely. easy to promise all sorts of things. You know, we'll be carbon neutral by 2060. You know, so great. You know, nobody's going to be alive that's at the meeting. You know, <laughs> and the people who are making the promises, yeah. they're not going to be alive yeah. to see whether they achieve, whether that commitment was achieved or not. No, absolutely. I mean, the thing about it is, also that makes it difficult, is there isn't a linear causality. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, what I always came up against when I was at Greenpeace was, you know, people say, including, you know, right-wing people in the media would say things like, uh, you know, the how can renewable energy solve the problem because the sun only shines at a certain time and the wind only blows? And I would say, but you know, if humanity could send people to the moon and to space and so on, please don't tell, this is like 15 years ago now, or 20 years ago, uh, you know, I said, please don't tell me that we cannot find a solution to how we could store energy, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I think part of the problem for, from the activist side is we framed what we need to do as there's got to be hardship. Mm -hmm. It's got to be so bad, right? So, for example, let's just take one example. If people walked more that they traveled in private cars, right? Is there a way you can present that in a really positive way? Wow, mm -hmm. this could extend your life. You have more because, you, you know, you're going to be getting more exercise. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems today is that we've, 
you know, we've become too car dependent, which has a negative. Then, but oftentimes, or, or even giving up meat, mm-hmm. right? And yeah, again, you know, I, I, I always said, don't say to people, give up meat, right? Say to people, reduce meat, mm-hmm. right? But say then, by reducing it, you open up yourself to uh, some amazing things in the cuisine and blah, 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 right? Uh, so part of it has been a messaging problem. The other thing is, and uh, yeah, it's a sad thing to say, but I think one of the sort of fatal errors we made was presenting climate change as an environmental issue. Because for me, now I've come to understand that climate change is a overarching, cross-connecting issue. It's about the economy, it's about energy, it's about transport, it's about our soil, it's about biodiversity, it's about so many things. It's not just about uh, you know, the environment. Yeah. Right? And, and, and in it, the biggest difficulty has been this question of jobs. Mm-hmm. So what happens to the workers that work in polluting industries? So I don't know whether you remember in the 60s and 70s and 80s, early 80s in the US, they used to talk about red-green tensions. Mm -hmm. And red-green tensions was the tension between environmentalism and labor. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And when I find myself as the head of Greenpeace uh, between 2009 and 2016, I'm very lucky to have a counterpart who's heading up the global trade union movement, a woman called Sharon Burrows from Australia, who is absolutely strategic, smart, uh, committed, and respected as a leader. We sit down, and we had a a relationship in the anti-poverty movement on debt cancellation and so on beforehand. So we had something to build on. And so we then started doing joint opinion pieces, pieces and so on. Basically trying to sort of build, if you want, a red-green alliance, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you'll be surprised to know the most powerful one-liner on climate is not stated by a environmentalist, but comes from the leaders of the trade union movement. Mm -hmm. And one of the lines, uh, I'll tell you a small anecdote. So uh, during 2010, 12, I want to say yes, mm-hmm. which was 20 years since the Rio big UN conference, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So it was called Rio plus 20. And so Ban Ki-moon then was Secretary General. He invited about 20 civil society leaders uh, into a conversation. Mm-hmm. So we're sitting outside waiting to meet him mm-hmm. and, and I'm chatting with, with, with Sharon. Yeah. And I say, and, and, I, and we swap notes, like, you know, she looks at my notes and, and then we looked at each other and said, you know what? We could easily use each other's notes for this meeting, and we roughly did that. Yeah. And poor Sir Ban Ki Moon is looking at his briefing documents, thinking, "Why is this trade union lady yeah. banging on about climate?" And yeah. then she eventually said, "Secretary General, you might wonder why, as a trade unionist, I am so committed to action on climate change." She said, "Because, as a mother, as a human being, and as a worker leader, I recognize." There are no jobs on a dead planet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that one line is yeah. often you'll see it. There are no jobs on a dead planet. And and, and she said that's that is why mm-hmm. I have to. Mm-hmm. And so what we one of the big changes that has helped is embracing this notion of a just transition. Yeah. Yeah. And the just transition is saying it doesn't have to be as painful as those who are resisting change suggest. A just transition would mean a couple of things. One is that younger workers in the fossil fuel industry and other polluting industry can be trained for new jobs in a renewable energy right. industry, for mm-hmm. example. Mm-hmm. That shouldn't be. Older workers who are close to retirement, we should ensure that if they don't want the training, that they somehow get some compensation and yeah. additional pension to allow them to retire with dignity. And thirdly, not to see the just transition simply about workers who are employed in the fossil fuel industry. Because like, if you take the biggest coal mine in South Africa, one of them called Medupi, you can, if that shut down and you found money to pay all the workers well and good, what about all the small industries that have built up over the last 20 years around that coal mine? Mm-hmm. Right? 
you know, small traders, small, you know, people running laundries, uh, you know, transport companies and so on. So how do you, if you do make the transition and close down big fossil fuel infrastructure, if you don't take the care mm -hmm. for that transition to support communities, then people are going to resist it. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing is most of our leaders on the continent, on the African continent, for example, mm -hmm. they, it's easy for them. They just say, basically, listen, we accept that climate change is real, but so long as the rich nations of the world, like the United States and Australia and parts of Europe and so on, who built the economies on dirty energy, so long as they continue to use it, they are in no position to tell us not to use it. Mm -hmm. And our argument to them is, okay, we see your point, and that is why we fight for the Green Climate Fund and for compensation and so on. But you cannot bury your head when it is your people who are facing the first and most brutal impacts from climate change. Right. And, and lives are being lost, you know. I'll just end by saying, in 2022, in my home city, in Durban, South Africa, in two days, we lost 500 people like that. Mm -hmm. and infrastructure damage on a scale unimaginable because we just in two days had historically never close to the levels of rains that we had mm -hmm. right? and the infrastructure just couldn't deal with it and today there's hardly a country in the world really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you cannot find extreme weather events that are happening which you can't simply say is normal right, right. You know? let's conclude with um, something you said when you were talking to our uh, audience yesterday uh, that included a lot of students, uh, that you know, young people uh, didn't accept the kinds of limitations that older people did, that they could dream, dream big. Um, that's one of the uh, problems of getting older, is that you get a lot of experience and you say, well, that's been tried before and it really didn't work all that well. and so. Let's not just try to make those mistakes again. But how do you balance the need to really rethink institutions, practices from the ground up, realizing that the old ones really aren't working with this accumulated knowledge that actually human beings as individuals and human societies as collectives really do have limits and there are certain things that they're not going to be able to do and we have to be you know, quote unquote, realistic about, you know, the kind of change that we can accept. Yeah. So, yeah, I draw a lot of my inspiration from Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. right, where in a year before he was assassinated, he, in multiple speeches, promoted this idea of what he called creative maladjustment, where you were saying that there are certain things that have been accepted as norms. We really should not adjust to it religious bigotry, racial discrimination, and the economy, the importantly on the economy is says, economic conditions that take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few when millions of God's children are smothering in an entire cage of poverty in an affluent society. Clearly, the problem has got much worse since he articulated the words in the 60s. So the young people, firstly, we have to, in our generation, accept that we have put young people into a horrific situation. Really, we have left them, you know, with so much of insecurity that almost it feels as if we failed in what we needed to deliver to the younger generation. But I think right now, when we're saying young people must dream, they have to dream in strategic ways, right? For one, you know, I'm constantly saying to young people, while I accept your anger and I res you honor you, even your anger, it doesn't serve us to burn schools or to burn public infrastructure that belongs to the people, right? It doesn't matter who built it, when it was built, and so on. If we burn it or destroy it in any way, understand that you are destroying a capability that's necessary for the quality of human life to be. So the first thing is don't destroy or don't get into a mentality of you get so angry and you feel so pissed off as many young people feel that you feel almost that that's a legitimate expression. Secondly, also to recognize that violence historically has really not delivered in a sustainable way that which humanity seeks for itself. And actually when you deploy violence, 
without sufficient thought and care, right? So Mandela, for example, you know, when he engaged uh, the armed struggle, one of these logics was, he said, if we don't do this, then we're going to have anarchic violence breaking out everywhere. If we do this, we can channel the anger of our people in a disciplined way and they won't, uh, you know, there were very few like uh, civilian targets. Uh, you know, the ANC had a policy against what they call soft targets, which was a word I hated. But in any case, you know, but still it happened periodically, but generally those pr principles of, for me anyway, non-violence is, because non-violence is also tactically right, but also it gives you a greater moral authority to appeal to larger numbers of people, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very small number of people, even in the most difficultly conflictual societies who gravitate to violence. Most people want violence to stay away from their lives, right? So if you, you don't destroy, you dream big, you don't engage in violence, do you still then have tools? Absolutely. And the biggest tool that young people have is the freshness of the perspectives on old intractable issues that we've been stuck in terms of moving forward, right? Now, some of those solutions will sound ridiculously radical to the older generation, maybe including to us, right? But the question is, how do they for fight for the space for those alternative ideas to be rigorously interrogated, explored? And yeah, to be fair to young people, right? They're not, they're not saying you old people are just completely useless, just go and die somewhere, right? They, they, seek, they seek us out, right. they, they want conversation and so on. So they want to hear what didn't work. But what they don't want is this, where we say that didn't work in that context in 1960, so it definitely won't work in yeah. this context in 2024. Right. right. right? They right. want to understand why it didn't work at, 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 at a point. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing, and this might sound very soft point to conclude on, I mean, basically, we are dealing with a mega global mental health crisis right now. And younger people are at the forefront of it. The number of young women and young girls actually who are asking the question, should we have kids given what's coming with climate change? It's a horrifically tragic situation that we've put young girls into, that they even have to ask that question, right? So we have to, in our generation and the leaders of young people, have to be thinking about young people as precious assets for the future, uh, helping them get through this period of pain and uncertainty and so on. But to also design the way you seek change to be life-affirming, fun, community-building oriented and, and so on. And the last thing I would say is, you know, the two big reasons why we should commit to a scale of mobilization that humanity has never seen before because we've got so much to change in a very short space of time because the climate clock is ticking. So that's the most important reason. And we need a different orientation to activism. It's not simply about going and lobbying against somebody you think that's going to deliver everything. It's also about figuring out what agency you have to actually deliver certain things in a way that gets those with power to say, oh, how embarrassing it is. Those folks were able to do it and they don't have state power or corporate power. How can we not do it, right? So that's one thing about getting the changes that you need. Yeah. You need the high level of public participation. But I would also say that harnessing this extent of participation in public life that is critically necessary now, it's also probably one of the best strategies to manage the global mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Because when people have community, they have things to do that give their lives meaning. Agency. Agency, and yeah. also doing it together with other people of their mm -hmm. own age or similar age, it means that they're not becoming more and more atomized 
right? Because if you look at gun violence in the United States, for example, mm -hmm. and you do a profile of the young people that were moved to commit these acts of violence and shoot up people at the school and all, they share one thing often in common, and that is they end up being atomized, mm -hmm. meaning that mm -hmm. they were largely loners, that they had no community, no outlet, and so on. And it's the next decade is not going to be easy. The next decade is not going to be easy. And so taking care of taking care of the people that are fighting mm -hmm. to change things should be as important a concern as whatever issue of activism that you're working on. Yeah, well, Kumi Naidu, uh, you've been thinking big and you've been on the ground inspiring people. So I want to thank you very much for talking to me and for being here and then for you know, your whole lifetime of activism where in so many different issues you've, you know, you've made a difference. And I think one of the biggest ones is actually persuading other people, younger people, that they can make a difference. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Frank. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank okay, you. Okay, very good. Thanks.